and help everyone better understand the needs and wants of farmers from land reform. And we're also hoping to make links between the parallel narratives of land reform in Scotland, England and Wales, because they're all working at different rates and doing different things under different legal jurisdictions. Uh, and it's really, it, this is a really useful time to bring those together. We don't have a, many opportunities to look across borders. All right, we've got more people rolling in now. This is great. Um, we, uh, one of the other more implicit aims of the session is just to move this conversation forward. This is a conversation that um, many of us in Scotland have been part of for a while, and many in England and Wales have been part of on, on different uh, trajectories within the land reform conversation. Uh, and we, we want this session to be an opportunity for all of those narratives to, to progress and be different from um, where they were at the beginning of this session. So hopefully by the end, everyone will have something to take away and everything, everyone will have learned something basically. Uh, I'm gonna assume that pretty much everyone who's coming is now here because we're at 1.39. Um, so the session is gonna be a mix of formats. Uh, we're gonna be starting with a few presentations early on uh, where you'll be uh, listening to a few of the speakers that we have today. And we'll gradually be transitioning towards a more open conversation with, with the room as a whole. But before we go into full swing with all of the, the presentations, we are going to go into pairs in breakout rooms. And we're just going to be using breakout rooms to answer one question. And I'm going to pop that into the chat now. You might want to take note of what this question is because you won't be able to see it uh, in, a, in a moment uh, when you go into the breakout rooms. So the question, that I'm going to ask everyone to answer is what is the single biggest reason you are here at this webinar discussing land reform? So I'm going to put you into pairs. You're going to have just one other person in your breakout room. You'll have three minutes. So you have 90 seconds each to give your full throttle answer. And then you can switch the table around and listen to the other person for 90 seconds straight. So can I just check before we go off and do that? Is anyone unclear on what is about to happen? And I, have, I don't know if there's been any questions since I was speaking that I might have missed. All right, no one's shouting at me, so we're gonna go forward into that. Let me just do some mental maths. We've got 18 people here. All right, so nine rooms, great. All right, see you all again in three minutes. Three, two, one, and we should get a big tidal wave of people in now. Fantastic. All right. Well, I'm sorry I couldn't join any of the groups there, but I hope you guys just had a great crack and chat. And um, that was just to get you fired up, uh, hopefully, before going back into listening mode. And now we're going to be moving towards some presentations. And we all the thoughts and ideas that you might have just come up with in that little breakout room can come out later in the second half of the session. Um, so first of all, I'd like to present today, uh, I'd like to invite Kirsty and James to present on behalf of the Scottish Land Commission. And just before I do so, I'll share with you what I know about these two people. Um, Kirsty Tate is a land reform practitioner supporting change within urban and rural communities. She currently works with the Scottish Land Commission and is responsible for practically implementing Scotland's land rights and responsibilities statement. Prior to this, she worked for the Carnegie UK Trust, where she supported some of the early pioneers of the community land trust movement in England and Wales. Her connection to land stems from and continues through supporting her family's secure tenanted farm in Perth. Uh, James McKessick Leach is a policy officer at the Scottish Land Commission, primarily focusing on modernising land rights, governance, and ownership. He also leads on work to improve agricultural land access for new entrants and progressing farmers. Coming from a family farm in the Lake of Moray and being a former director of a local community development trust, he has some experience of the challenges and opportunities faced on either side of the policy and practice fence. So without further ado, I'll be handing over to Kirsty, I think, to share your screen and start the presentation. 
Hi everyone, uh, thanks for having James and I here. It's a great pleasure to be here. So I'm gonna start. Um, and just let me see if you can see this. We're gonna do, use a bit of visuals and text sometimes. I think it helps with these uh, presentations to see things as well as listen. So, so James and I are from the Scottish Land Commission and we're going to give you, I mean, literally a 15 minute whirlwind tour around everything that we're involved in and then kind of more about the background of land reform in Scotland as well. So I'm going to hand over to James, who's going to talk about, about land reform Scotland and where we've come from. Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, Land reform in Scotland is obviously something that gets talked about quite a lot in Scotland, um, and I know there are certain audiences elsewhere as well that are very interested in what we're doing. I think the first thing to point out, though, is that land reform has an extensive history in Scotland. So although there's the more modern things that people are familiar with, the very first attempt at any sort of control on governance was the Common Good Act of 1491, um, which protected the, the common lands of the boroughs of Scotland, and that's still in force today. It's obviously not modern legislation, it doesn't do what it needs to do, but the impetus and, and the intent has been there for, for nearly five centuries. More modern um, legislation, particularly since the, the coming of the Scottish Parliament, um, have enabled things like the original Land Reform Act in 2003, which in, instituted the community right to buy, uh, a kind of a first in the world type of, of legislation. Um, and likewise, subsequent acts have continued to build on that. One of the things that is quite clear across um, of Scotland and particularly within the Parliament is this is a cross-party endeavour. The first two um, acts there, so the Agricultural Holdings 2003 and the Land Reform 2003 acts were piloted by the Labour Liberal Coalition government in Scotland uh, at that time. The Community Empowerment Act and the Land Reform 2016 Act have been powered by the, the, the current SNP government but with broad political support right across the chamber. So this is something that, that does have support and, and, and does represent a direction of travel that is perhaps quite different north of the border than it is south. Of course, it's also an emotive subject and a lot of that driver rests on, on those foundations. People will be familiar with things like the Highland Clearances, with, with the concentration of ownership that, that Scotland possesses. So 50% of, of privately owned land is owned by less than 500 people in Scotland. But I think ultimately reform is a process and it's not a goal. It's something that doesn't have an end point. It is something that continues on. So there isn't an answer to the question, well, when will you be finished? When will the problem be solved? Because it won't be. Um, and I think that's, that's time to move on to our wee video. Land matters because we all use it and we all need it. The way land is owned and used in Scotland affects housing, access to green space, the success of businesses, the health of communities, and our ability to take action against climate change. The list of demands on our land grows and evolves every day, and we need to work to share the benefits of Scotland's land more widely across our growing and changing population. Land is central to our economy, and by making better use of it, we can provide value to more of the people of Scotland. We need to consider property rights alongside our economic, social and cultural rights. In order to meet Scotland's ambitious climate targets, the way land is used will need to change. The principles of the Scottish Government's Land Rights and Responsibility Statement give us a roadmap for making this transition fair and well managed. At the Scottish Land Commission, we are working to create a Scotland where land is owned and used in ways that are fair, responsible and productive. A Scotland where more people are able to shape and benefit from decisions about land and a place where land use and land ownership create public value and economic well-being. We are working to achieve our goals by reforming land rights, changing the way land is owned and controlled to drive economic, social and environmental value, strengthen community resilience and reduce inequalities, reforming land markets, improving the efficiency and equity of land markets to support a fair and productive economy, 
and putting accountability and responsibility at the heart of land ownership and use. We are involving many different people and organisations in our work to hear diverse perspectives, perform our analysis and gather the evidence that informs our advice and recommendations to Scottish ministers, parliament and stakeholders. We are leading the change in practices that help people and organisations fulfil the principles of the Land Rights and Responsibility Statement. We will also continue to deliver the Tenant Farming Commissioner's functions as part of our work. We are creating a Scotland where everyone benefits from the ownership, management and use of the nation's land. So thanks everyone, that was, um, we actually just uh, published that uh, video last week, so you're one of the first audiences to see it. So that gives us a really brief overview of what we do. And what James and I are now going to focus on is really bring it back down to practice and what practically um, people can do now and what they can use and how it might impact um, the kind of smallholders, farmers in this audience. Um, so I'm going to quickly, really quickly, delve a bit into the Scottish Land Rights and Responsibility Statement and the work of our Good Practice Programme. So Scotland's Land Rights and Responsibility Statement is the first of its kind in the world and it sets out a vision for a strong and dynamic relationship between Scotland's land and its people. The, I would I really would encourage everyone to have a read of it and it, it's it's not too long and um, it's not too onerous but it is it's a fantastic statement and um, sets out the six principles which sets out how a relationship between land and people should help achieve rights, share responsibilities and benefits among a wider range of people. So I'm going to talk more about those principles later on and how we are going to work and um, to put these into practice. So the theme that we work under, uh, myself and the Good Practice Pro Programme, is embedding responsible land ownership and use. So underneath this, we are helping people and organisations to adopt the statement. We're looking at ways to further include um, land rights and responsibilities in public policy and in responsible business conduct across relevant sectors. And James will talk more about the um, agricultural tenure through the work of the Tenant Farming Commissioner. So I work in the Commission for the Good Practice Programme and a key, we have a key role here in developing and realising the statement's six principles. And this is really to help drive the culture change needed to make more of Scotland's land. So our Good Practice Programme has been designed to provide a visible and coordinated approach to encourage and enable with those who have an interest in land, so that's landowners, managers and communities, to recognise and fulfil their rights and responsibilities in practical ways. So we work with a Good Practice Advisory Group and we produce protocols, which I'll talk about next, guidance, training, and we also have developed um, what we're calling land rights and responsibility self-assessments for landowners in Scotland. We also offer a advice and casework service, which actually supports the implementation of the expectations set out in our protocols. And where appropriate, we do get involved in individual cases to provide advice and engage with the relevant parties to support resolution and improvements in practice. So these are uh, the land rights and responsibilities principles. I'm not going to read them out one by one, um, but very quickly, the first principle looks at um, the overall framework of land rights, responsibilities and public policies and sets out how we can respect relevant human rights in relation to land. The second one encourages a more diverse pattern of land ownership and tenure. The third uh, states, out, states that more local communities should have the opportunity to own, lease or use buildings. The fourth looks into good stewardship and sets out what that might look like and how that can be achieved. The fifth looks at improved transparency. This is really important. It's about transparency of information about the ownership, use and management of land. This, a lot of what we do hinges on this transparency. There's not much you can do if you don't actually know who owns the land and who has responsibility for making those land use decisions on that land. And finally, another kind of bedrock of our work is there should be greater collaboration and community engagement in decisions about land. 
So what are our land rights and responsibilities protocols? So these protocols take six, the six um, land rights and responsibilities principles. Sorry, there's a lot of words here. <laughs> I'll try to make this understandable. And they actually set out, they take the words, the high level words, and they actually set out what good practice looks like um, and sets out practical expectations of what is expected of landowners, managers and communities. They give us an opportunity, a tool to enhance accountability by providing that feedback mechanism to ourselves at the Commission. And they support all relevant parties to take a fair and reasonable approach. These are important because they help us, the Commission, to collect evidence of where further action might be needed to take in, where change, or where change is needed for land reform. And they also can be used by anybody in Scotland, um, but they are particularly useful for communities and businesses um, and for landowners and managers because they set out what responsibility, what responsible to responsible practice looks like. So very quickly, um, this is our suite of land uh, rights and responsibilities protocols. Do go onto our website, have a look, um, and you'll be able to read more in depth and also I'm here to answer any questions and I'm going to hand over to James to give a bit more about our actually policy work and our research work and where we're going with that. Yes yeah, so while the, the protocols and, and the land rights and responsibilities statement exist they are there because of a reason and that reason is the tension around the scale and concentration of land ownership in Scotland and how that pattern has developed. It is a key issue of power and control and that that's quite clear because if you own the land you make the decisions about the management you make the decisions about who can access that land and for what purpose and at what cost um but it's also not about scale per se there is a a, a strong body of thought that thinks capping land ownership at say ten thousand hectares would be go a long way to solve some of the issues but our research is quite clear that that's not the case because it's actually more about the control and it is about rurality if you have an island situation of say 8,000 hectares, but that landowner controls all the housing, the shop, the pub, the hotel, everything else, then they're under that threshold, but the power they have and, and they can exercise is quite substantial. And this leads us to say, well, actually the issues associated with concentrated power and land ownership are very much paralleled with monopolies in, in other sectors of the economy. And therefore, perhaps we should be looking at land ownership and those issues of power as issues of monopoly and deal with them in the same way that we would deal with monopolies in the retail sector or in media or or in any other sector of the economy where that sort of thing wouldn't be tolerated so that's very much the foundation of, of, of where we got to with this and um, next slide please Kirsty. <laughs> so this very much kind of frames around market power and the disadvantages in our research were quite clear about this and it is as i say that concentration of, of social economic and decision making power and it is quite clear as well looking at that graphic you can see that there are examples of controls right across other sectors of the economy banking supermarkets power you know it's all very well understood that monopolies in these sectors are bad for consumers they're bad for the economy they're bad for innovation they're bad for resilience but in the land market at the moment the only qualification is the stretch of your checkbook that's the only qualification for owning land in scotland as it stands and that means we end up in a situation where we have a highly concentrated pattern of ownership, where communities often live at the whim of their landowner. And therefore, systemic change is required. And that's very much shaped our thinking um, going forward. So we can move on again, please, Kirsty. <laughs> so out of this research, we have a number of recommendations um, broken down into statutory uh, policy and, and good practice ones. So, the one at the end there around good practice is very much the work that Kirsty and, and the good practice team focus on. For myself um, and, the, and the policy team, we, we work on developing some of the others. And in terms of statutory mechanisms, we're looking at things like a public interest test for significant transfers, which parallels with the powers of the Competition and Markets Authority when they assess mergers and acquisitions. So it's really not that radical because it exists right across other sectors of the economy and is perfectly acceptable practice and has been for decades. Likewise, things like a, a statutory land rights and responsibilities review. Again, those powers already exist in other sectors of the economy and in other walks of life to take issues where there are problems, have an investigation and come up with solutions about how they can be fixed. 
And between those levels of, of statutory intervention and, and good practice, there are policy um, areas as well. So promoting a pattern of, of diverse private ownership because land reform isn't just about greater community ownership. It's also about those individuals, about family farms, about people who want to build their own house and have a garden and, and grow some veg, about people who want to join a forestry cooperative, all these different options that, that could build a much more diverse pattern of land ownership in Scotland that simply don't have the room to do that at the moment. And, and that's where we've got to with that. So very much a, a work in progress. Specifically on the agricultural side of things, uh, the Land Commission is home to the Tenant Farming Commissioner, whose role is set out in legislation quite clearly to facilitate better relationships between agricultural tenants and agricultural landlords. And he has the power to issue codes of practice, which do have legal weight and act as a, an illustration or an articulation of how um, good behaviour is, is expected to be and act as a measure against which to, to, to assess behaviour. Alongside that, there are guidance notes to, to further break down the, the requirements. And also there is the facilitation role of, of bringing parties together to, 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 to resolve disputes and also to provide mediation where, where that's appropriate. And the part of the work that, that I largely focus on with, with regard to the agricultural side of things is looking at barriers to entry and increasing that land availability for agriculture, because that is, that is a big part of our work and particularly for new entrants and for progressing farmers availability of land uh, at, a, at, a, at a reasonable cost as well is, is something that is a huge challenge and, and regardless of climate change and Brexit and whatever else is going on it's another problem that, that we need to address sooner rather than later. So Kirsty here. Yeah. Um, so in, in detail I won't spend too much time on this because I think you're probably largely aware but land values um, particularly when it comes to agricultural land are incredibly disconnected from um, from agricultural use. So the economic value of, of production uh, for agriculture is divorced from the value of the land as it's seen as an asset. Um, but it's not just that, that that's an issue. One of, the one, one of the bigger ones that we've come across, particularly for family farms or, or for former family farms, is around succession planning. Um, and there is, there is a struggle for farmers when particularly the next generation has decided to to move into other sectors of the economy to, to, to chart a different course with their life, what do they do with their own life's work? If you've spent 60 years of your life farming and, and building an enterprise, but don't have a successor, what, what is the plan? And succession planning is something that is really key to, to enabling new entrants, people particularly from non-farming backgrounds to, to get into the industry and, and to breathe new innovation and, and, and new life into it. And then of course there's tax and subsidy. Simply can't get away from the fact that there are substantial advantages, tax advantages to owning large areas of land. And that is a big driver of, of investment, particularly from abroad. Um, and that's an area that, that we need to address, but it needs to be addressed holistically in the round with everything else because tweaks in the tax system can have quite significant unintended consequences. So it's a really delicate piece of work that, that we're carrying forward at the moment. Um, Kirsty. So the research that we've had um, to, to, to do to look at this came up with four areas um, that we can look at specifically right now to, to try and address some of these issues. So work around joint ventures, uh, and that includes traditional agricultural tenancies, but can also look at kind of more innovative models as well. Tax incentives, as we've talked about, tax is a huge driver for, for accessing land. And we can see in the Republic of Ireland, um, people might be familiar with the, the income tax relief that has led to a dramatic increase in, in new tenancies there. Is that something that, that we could follow at a, at a UK level perhaps? A land matching service is another um, kind of obvious one, uh, really, where you're matching people um, who are seeking land with those who don't know what to do, potentially because they don't have a, a successor in mind. And farm incubators. So this is farm business incubators as opposed to poultry. Um, and that focuses very much on, on learning from other sectors of, of economy. Think of you know tech startups. A lot of them are, are incubated um, at, at, a, at a tech incubator. Why can't we do the same thing with, with farm businesses and particularly for new entrants trying to get in? And so again, that report is, is available from the Commission website and, and you can read much more detail into it. Um, Kirsty? So the Guide for Joint Ventures itself, again, this is a, a, one of our probably most popular um, publications, or it certainly is when I'm out and about on the road. And it does, as I say, encourage people to think about their options for new ways of working. So yes, traditional tenancies are great where that works for both people. But things like share farming, contracting, partnerships, seasonal lets all have a place as well. 
um, whether it's a seasonal let for, for a year just to test out what the business relationship is like, how you get on with each other, that's a great way to start. And it's often a great way for, for a lot of new entrants that we've worked with to get a foot on the ladder. And that can progress to something like share farming or to a, a more traditional partnership. So it's very much about not just supporting new entrants, this piece of work, but also about existing farmers, about providing a route for succession as well and ensure that both parties um, can, can really make the most of, of, of the future. So land matching service is something that, that we're particularly proud of, of being a part of. Um, and this is now up and running in Scotland. It does essentially, um, it is essentially Tinder for farmers, uh, if you like, in, in the sense that it matches those, you know, who are, who are looking for someone to come and work with them for someone who is, is seeking land and, and those types of opportunities. It's a facilitated service. Uh, we do have a dedicated um, uh, person to do that. So Ian Davidson, who's, who's based in, in Edinburgh, is, is the facilitator for the service. Um, he takes those calls, initiates those meetings and can provide advice in, in terms of agreements um, and, and support you know, those kind of initial conversations. Uh, and of course, this land matching service, while it's only really open to, to farmers in Scotland who wish to provide land, if you're south of the border and are looking for an opportunity to come north, then please do get onto the website and, and have a look if you're, if you're willing to, to come and join us in the wilds up here. That would be great. Um, and Farm Business Incubator. So again, very much paralleling what we've learned from, from other sectors of the economy. It provides that space and that land and that mentoring and, and those skills support. And it's a model, again, in agriculture that's been used quite widely in France and in the USA, and, and it is successful. Um, so it's it's something that we've been we've been working hard on, and we have had those initial discussions with with Scottish public landowners, um, as it says there. And there may be some considering, um, you know, as part of their their asset review, whether something like this would be something worth taking up. But again, for private landowners, for the private sector as well, um, it it might be a, a great thing for for a first time, you know, or for a first, there might be a huge first mover advantage in being an agricultural estate who wants to, to go down this path to developing the next wonder crop or the next brilliant business model or, or the next you know, environmentally sound process, who knows? And of course, it's not just about um, sitting in, in the wee office and, and coming up with all these ideas. A huge part of, of our work in this is, is about getting out and about and taking that message to people about promoting the opportunities that are there and, and, and the potential and as a, I'm glad I'm not wearing the same shirt again today as I do seem to be in all those photos. But, you know, this is a really important part of our work is, is about getting out and about just as much as it is for, for me as it is for Kirsty and it is for, for, for all the team. Um, and of course, it's not just rural Scotland as well. So recently, uh, in fact, just last, no, not last week, the week before we published a, a quite lengthy report on vacant and derelict land in Scotland. There are 11,000 hectares in Scotland alone of vacant and derelict land, mostly in urban areas and mostly in quite deprived areas of Scotland as well. And it's a huge, diverse and fragmented portfolio. Um, but the opportunities are there for things like community growing allotments, market gardens, as much as they are for housing, um, for retail space, for whatever it might be. Um, so there's, there's huge potential there for people in urban areas to get, to get stuck into growing and farming as well, if we can join other dots a bit. So what we've been doing is we have a task force um, with, it, with a huge number of public private sector bodies as well. Uh, we've developed a community impact tool so communities can, you know, if they're, if they're particularly concerned about a site near them or want to look at their potential, um, look at uh, how, they can, how can they can develop that and, 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 and see what the futures might be. Again, we've also got a site map. So if you're wondering where those 11,000 11, hectares are, you can jump onto our website and, and find them. Uh, we've also got a funding guide. So if you are interested in taking up a, a vacant derelict land project and, and breathing new life into a site, there's a, a guide there that, it's, that, that illustrates some funding for that. And of course, there are case studies. There's a huge range of different opportunities um, that, that this resource can provide. So again, there's case studies and all that's available on our website. So I would say if you're, if you're in an urban area and interested in urban farming, please do go and have a look. But thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'll stop sharing. That's our email addresses there. So do keep in touch. Um, if you think of any opportunities, if you've got any questions, do get in touch. Brilliant. Thank you so much, guys. That was, uh, that was a really rich presentation. There's quite a lot to absorb there, especially if um, 
if it's all brand new to you because this is all it's all fairly brand new to Scotland really uh, Scottish Land Commission has only been around for three years I think so if that wasn't clear from the presentation you know a lot of a lot of work has been done in a very short space of time um, so from the the story of the, the foundation of the Scottish Land Commission and um, their work on building on the story of, of land reform we're going to be moving towards a practical example of of how it has played out in practice uh, in at one estate in Scotland um, and so we'll be handing over soon to uh, Ninian Stewart who is the the owner of Auckland estate which is a very large very diverse uh, estate in Scotland which has been um, working towards its own vision of land reform um, before the Scottish Land Commission even came into existence um, and since working together and I should just note um, for questions if anyone has any questions to the speakers about the presentations just to put them in the chat now and we'll we'll listen to the presentation from um, Ninian and Adele um, in a moment and uh, we'll we'll take all the questions together uh, as a one after the presentation uh, because there's like I say they've been working together lately and we're going to be teasing out what it feels like to be to be working in collaboration and reforming uh, land locally so before we head on I will introduce the next speakers. So we have Adele Clark, who is an educator and community facilitator who works to reconnect communities with the land through regenerative cultural design and embracing heritage. She's currently working with Falkland Estate and the Centre of Stewardship to explore the roles that regenerative agriculture, localised food systems and integrated landscape use can play in becoming part of the solution for a healthy planet and in support of the UN Sustainable Development Goals and she has a background in botany, geology, and landscape archaeology, amongst other things. We also have Ninian Stewart, who is the estate owner at Falkland Estate, uh, with a commitment to reviving the relationship between people and land whilst addressing inequalities. Following many years in community care, advocacy, and social enterprise, he's co-founder of the Centre for Stewardship, the Fife Employment Access Trust, and a Thousand, Cut a Thousand Huts campaign. Ninian's main focus now is on sustainable community-based land management whilst teasing out the tensions of holding the hereditary keepership of Falkland Palace whilst working towards a just transition locally, regionally and globally. So without further ado, uh, I think I will be passing over to Ninian who may be sharing your screen soon. Yeah, thank you, Finn. And thanks for kind of getting this going. I'm kind of also really interested that we don't have a huge number, which for me is a real advantage, because I think if Adele and I can kind of keep it tight enough, then we can have some really good conversation. Um, and st thanks also for starting off with your, um, gosh, well, the provocation around dastardly opportunities, which I'm quite enjoying, but also um, at the start of actually quickly putting us into little groups, which was really interesting. And the, what, what came up for me in response to your question of, you know, why am I here is that I've been spending my life with this question of why me? So I come from a family who have owned land and go back to Robert the Bruce and in a sense, and who have held the land for a long time. I was a second son or the second son of a second son. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but I kind of thought, why me? I don't want to do this. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to be a community worker. So there's a bit of having kind of worked and I'm now 63. So I kind of worked, my father died when I was 25. So I've had that long to try to kind of work on this and it is, yeah, it's slow work or, or maybe I'm slow work. So I'm going to share my screen and start off and between, in fact, I'm going to put my timer on, resume timer. So between Adele and I were um, I'm probably going to do about two thirds of this, but give you a little bit of background of Falkland. So there we are. So hopefully you can all see my screen. So here kind of, yeah, Falkland is an amazing place. It's been around a long time, like most places have, but actually it's one of those places where you can really see that it's been around a long time. So we've recently been doing work on the top of the Lomond, you see on the two left-hand side images. And this is what we think it looked like pre-feudal times. So kind of around about 600, 650 AD. And then if you look to the right, there is the second oldest landscape picture in Scotland by Alexander Keirinx in 1633. And it shows 
the park to keep the deer in and the people out, um, the Palace of Falkland, which I'm um, coming to you from. Um, it even has Wi-Fi these days. And then at the bottom right, you will see um, one of the things about being a place where the kings and queens were was that actually the borough citizens had stronger rights. So in fact, the comity of the Lomans um, was a lot later in being divided because the citizens had rights. And so in the bottom, you'll see Oliver O'Grady, who sadly died a couple of months, but actually he was um, looking at what the stones to mark the division of the Comanty in 1818 were. So the estate is, it's been around a long time. Um, it's been home hunting lodge of Stuart Kings. It, we own about 4,000 acres at the moment. Um, I've been playing, I'm a Stuart and go back to the early Stuart kings, but also my take is that before the Stuarts became kings, they actually, they only got it because they married the king's daughter. Um, they married Mar Marjorie Bruce. So there's something about saying, actually there's something that's even deeper and older here, which is about stewardship, which is looking after things for others. And our work at Falkland since about 2006, actually worked with um, Kirsty very a long time ago at that point, but which was about how do we really do that? How do we, and this whole thing of the dance of holding on and letting go. And we are, we're, we're, we're on the road towards community ownership and trying to work out how to do that. So how do we extend that circle? Um, ah, let me just, why am I not? Well, there we are. Um, so the next one is just kind of tapping into the hill. So these little oddments came up from some of the work that we've done with, we worked with about 18 schools around the hills on some archeology span of looking at what was under our feet. And this is a sense of what was coming up from the old ancient hill port. And there's something about the land has held all of these things in the past and it's provided. So pottery spindles for, um, kind of garments and hammer stones and and jewelry and all of those things. So actually, the land the land ecosystem services absolutely give us so much, and we sometimes forget that these days. Um, one of the people, if you're Scottish, you might know Patrick Geddes, kind of late nineteenth century, early twentieth century, coined the phrase "think global, act local." Um, and was a real polymath, a real deep radical. Um, and he spoke at one point at Falkland's drill hall on, um, sorry, I have to change this thing because these pictures have gotten away here. Um, so um, anyway, he, he, he spoke about sort of past, present, future of countryside use. And he came up with this valley section, which we're seeing here and we'll come back to but which was looking at the land and what it provides to people. Now, this is in a sense, a historical thing, but we still have mining. We still have woodmanship. We still hunt. Um, there are still shepherds. There are still people who work the land. And some of these words like, gosh, hunters and what, whatever it are probably changing a bit, but gardeners and fishers. So there's something about the land and what it gives us. Um, right, I'm having a problem with my, oh, there we are. So the journey we are on is a journey of stewardship and a journey of becoming an enabling estate. So moving from me to we, from land that is owned by a laird, as we call them in Scotland, um, to shared stewardship. And we're looking at what it might mean to re restore the commons. We're focus, focusing again with Patrick Geddes. He talked about place folk work um, in terms of sustainable development. That's you know the same as people, place and purpose or economics. Um, we're looking at respectful farming, forestry, hospitality, sharing prosperity, and of course this word, the circular economy. And we're really also looking at what does good land governance involve? And when the Land Commission came here, um, they kind of said some lovely things about what they saw in terms of shared prosperity, but their challenge was to say, you know, even before moving on the ownership, what about looking at how to kind of really engage and widen out this governance? 
So we're really consciously trying to look at that. And um, recently we've managed to get, or through some universities and um, involvement in the Land Commission, um, and, and Adele will probably talk about it, a bit of money to kind of look over the next six months about what that might mean. So, um, gosh, cash poor, asset rich. Um, the place has fallen apart. <laughs> the, this, um, the steading that was rebuilt in the 1920s, and in fact, they found this picture stone in the middle in it, um, but actually is falling apart now because actually modern day farming, it needs bigger places than this. So we're trying to look together with people. This was a group from Napier University and Harvard who came along to kind of help, help and look at how can we kind of rebu rebuild, how can we redesign something here? And we've consciously been trying to work with people around the hills. So whilst Falklands in North Fife um, sort of fairly relatively affluent area, um, on the other side of the hill is some of the most disadvantaged areas. Um, the last communist councillor was there in Britain. The last communist MP used to sit just on the other side of the hill. So there is something about how can this hill that we share, how can we engage people in this land? And how can this land really, gosh, feed us? And this is some pictures about feeding us with um, Bridie there, who's one of the new farmers. Jack, who was an apprentice, who's in the middle, um, looking after the cows. He was more of a forester, actually. And Kevin, who lives on the estate and who has been working with us a few years. And Sam in a local um, kind of market that we began to develop through a project called Local Food Works and a place that a number of people will know here, a kind of organic farm shop and cafe called Pillars of Hercules. And we actually sold Bruce the land. So he owns that shop and cafe, which is why he was able to develop that so well. Um, but it's not just about feeding ourselves, it's also about clothing ourselves. And so there's also this question, at the moment you get 25p for a bag of wool, for a whole fleece. And basically we've lost that connection with the materials that we grow and what then becomes your jumper that you wear. So we're really beginning to look at how to do that. Um, and we love huts. Um, I have a little hut bottom right um, in the woods, favorite place in the world for me, where I try to go once a week and spend time, stay overnight when I can. I've now got a neighboring hutter. We're now in the top left. We've got a new hut site at Falkland and managed along the way to help persuade Scottish government to change planning regulations and building regulations for more people to be able to build these huts. And you'll see in the bottom left, that was for an event that Adele was involved in running um, called Art of Mentoring and people beginning to make their showers and toilets for it. Um, and so I'm moving towards where I'm going to hand over, but I'm back to Patrick Geddes here. So this is looking from the hills down towards, and you would see the sea as you look down in that bottom picture. And it really reflects um, Patrick Geddes, who kind of in a sense, he, he really developed community-based town planning. Um, and you'll see in the top stained glass, microcosm of nature, seat of humanity, theatre of history and good place of the future. And that could have been written about Falkland, but it actually could have been written probably about the land where you, wherever you are. So this, this thing about working with nature, working with, gosh, the being born, living and dying, and we're seeing a lot of dying now. So how do we work with being human in this world? And the slide at which I am going to pass on to Adele is that we're kind of looking at, so this is um, International Futures have developed this. And the first horizon is the business that we're trying to run on the estate and trying to keep afloat and trying to keep viable. And we will be losing jobs at this point, like so many people. Um, the second horizon is about the trying to kind of develop the new, the innovation on top of that, the things that will begin to get it all to stand up post-Brexit, post-Covid. Well, it'll be a long time probably till post-Covid. Um, but then there is the third horizon, which is really seeding the things that will be the long term. And that's what we're trying to do at Falkland. And at this point, Adele, would you like to pick up? 
wherever you are. Wherever I am. <laughs> oh, thanks, Ninian. Um, yeah, so I was really struck with um, James saying about, you know, part of their work, the Land Commission, is to get out and about. And for me, Falkland and what I'm about is welcoming people in. So there's that balance of in and out. Um, and we are really looking at ways of learning from the past and repairing some of that gradual disconnect that's happened over time be between people and land, people and people in communities, and even people and their sense of meaning and purpose, especially as it relates to their land or place in which they live. So that welcoming in, in an experiential way, linking the love of land um, is, is a big theme, I think, for, 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 for Falkland. And we're really looking at what does a strong and dynamic relationship um, between land and its people look like on, on the ground and what's needed to bring about that culture change in a place like Falkland, even on that small scale of, a, of one estate, how do we actually bring that into, into a sense of being um, and create a shared understanding for uh, multiple stakeholders? So the reason the three horizons is still there is because the three horizons are always present. So the past, at the moment, we are working with the, the primarily financial and um, governance legal issues that actually keep us quite constrained but there's also those good practices from the past and there's also these little areas of a third horizon a new vision which may be informed often by the past that have always popped up at, in a place like Falkland it actually you know it actually seems to gather people and inspire people to think on that bigger context um, of being really related to the land and closing down those those distances. Um, so we're working to look at, you know, how do you really put regenerative agriculture and practices that, that support that at the heart of designing a regenerative community, which which encompasses all of the, the biosphere. Um, and through, through using food systems, for instance, as one, or, or forms of agriculture, you're connecting immediately with, or with food, with shelter, with learning, with well-being, and with the climate and biodiversity issues. So that's, we're looking at two different ways of, you know, how do we actually, or two different general lenses. One is, encompassing the kind of business how do you bring business and um, policy into a framework that also can understand the the kind of passion of people for the land so really looking how do we pull on the love of land from whatever area you are coming from whatever type of stakeholder you might be in that land and weave them together into a sense of shared um, shared vision going forward so that we get rid of the sort of competition between stakeholders. And then in Falkland, you know, the stakeholders are very, very closely interlinked. So the estate is very, very open. People have a deep connection to the land just through walking by, you know, it's their hill, <laughs> it's their walk, you know, so, um, there is a, an inherent love of land and how do we pull that together to build a shared understanding for those multiple stakeholders. And one, uh, one approach that we're looking at and really interested in is the four returns, um, which looks at those four areas. It has, it takes into account the kind of natural returns for the, you know, the, the biosystem services and working around all those, those angles. It looks at the financial returns as well as the social returns and it embeds it all in that inspiration which really drives the motivation for people to engage in this. Um, 
So it's, a, it's an amazingly dynamic model. Um, and I think, it's, you know, for us, it's got a lot of potential. Well, that's my timer. <laughs> um, so we can maybe, yeah, the next slide. So there is a process um, that you can go through. And the other angle that we're going through is how do we build in this lived feeling of connection and engaging different sectors of the community to actually come in and feel that connection, actually understand that communities can come back together and that different sectors are no longer in competition. So it's about rebuilding those connections into a kind of living system. So the eight shields is another model that, that takes some inspiration from the way indigenous cultures relate to land. So, um, and if you can, you can see here, it takes its inspiration from the life cycles, from the farming year, from um, different aspects of community groupings here. And these, the kind of, on this one, that all the, um, we're talking about key of deep nature connection, involving those who mentor, living lightly on the earth, with systems such as permaculture, tending the wild, that we need relationship and peacemaking for communities coming together. And that's just inherent. It's not something that's a bad thing. We just build it in. That there is that inner work um, and transparent communication for good governance. All these systems need to come together. So that inner work and healing, really that's healing the relationships, but it's also about past intergenerational intergenerational wounds that may have built up around land and ownership and all of that stuff, all the messy stuff that gets in the way. Um, and then regenerative design. And that brings us kind of back to actually where a lot of our ancestral connections were, or one model, one way of really easily engaging people, which is around the, the Celtic wheel, for instance, just as one. But that takes immediately puts people into a felt sense of seasons with um, yeah, the agricultural year, with different types of inspiration that can come from connection and already with the, the landscape and the trees in this, in this instance. So we look into the past to kind of reweave a vision of the future, not keeping it stuck and bringing those two um, the kind of business and head side of things in alignment with the um, in alignment with that felt and more indigenous living with the land and so we're back to back to the hill and the way people related to land perhaps in a slightly more holistic manner so that's that's me <laughs> Thanks, Adele. Uh, Ninian, do you want to close with any comments there? Oh, just gratitude. Um, <laughs> I, 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 so I think gratitude partly for Adele, but I think also just gratitude for the kind of people who turn up at Falkland, actually, which is, and there is something about what happens when you let go. And I do want to say what happens at Falkland is sometimes bloody hard work and really tiring and we don't get it right and we're pushing boulders uphill for a long time. Um, but I do also think that the sense we do have a lot of people who are showing up of really who who kind of get it before I do actually. So, <laughs> so gratitude for the for the outsiders coming in, as I think Adele um, was just acknowledging, and and the balance between the outsiders and and the incomers. There's something about we've lost a bit of our in, so gosh indigeneity. Can we? But actually, one of the things I want to speak for families, even though my children and I are proposing to let go of the ownership of the estate, is I don't want to denigrate that because actually families who go back, all of our families go back. There is something about this being on the land for a long time, being in a place for a long time. Um, and I think a lot of people who are at Falkland talk about it being a family. I see it as kind of growing beyond the single family tree to trying to kind of look at how do we create that forest of which we're all part. Um, so that's maybe all I would just um, acknowledge and end on, Finn. Thanks, Ninian. Um, so thank you so much, Adele and Ninian, for your presentation of, of Falkland Estate. It's, it's lovely to see that. Um, that 
does that work? That's been, that's already happened. Um, I'm I'm just ch checking with the chat here because I've noticed we are a lot closer to the end of the session than I thought we would be at this point, and we had planned a couple of other um, kind of segments to this webinar, but we're going to have to do a little kind of uh, sways and, and turns. Um, well, one question uh, that's quite uh, direct actually that we have in the chat is perhaps towards you, Adele, um, from Cara Gillespie asking, is there a link or similar way of accessing more info on the full returns model? Or can we get a copy of the slide? Um, yes, um, there are. They have a website. Um, I, I'm pretty sure if you Googled for returns, you, you would get that. But I can certainly um, put, post that in the chat, actually. I'll put the, if, I can post the template if that's helpful. Um, Thanks. Um, we, I'm sure we can share slides as well uh, if there's a way of the conference organizers to do that. Um, then I'm sure that can be done. Um, so the the next part of the conversation that we had planned was to open out the session to questions whilst also at the same time starting a bit of a conversation between Kirsty and James and Adele and Ninian um, to look at how how land reform has like practically been undertaken um, with the work of the Scottish Land Commission and, um, and Ninian as a landowner. Uh, but we also have a question in the chat from one of the Rachels. We have two. Um, oh, and we have, I think we have a flurry of questions coming in now um, or messages from Ninian. Um, we have a, a question from Rachel with no surname, ask, um, which has dubbed you Ninian as a, an enlightened ancestral uh, landowner. And um, I think this kind of alludes also to um, Rachel Marshall's question, which is what advice and encouragement would you give those of us south of the border who don't feel like we have the political will behind land reform that you have in Scotland? And I guess I want to kind of dig into, well, perhaps Ninian, there's an element to which Ninian is an enlightened land owner, but also an element to which the the Scottish Land Commission is working towards a name that, that it doesn't require <laughs> enlightenment or any kind of radical um, impetus to get this process going, that it's a process that anyone can undertake um, and also anyone can undertake on any side of the border. Um, so, um, Kirsty or James, would you like to jump in there first and then we'll kind of open it out? Yeah, I mean, very practically, I mean, what we suggest, I mean, okay, you haven't got a English land rights and responsibility statement or a Welsh land rights and responsibility statement, but there is a huge amount of work going on. There's a huge amount of people working towards uh, future land reform, working in, in amongst land reform at the moment. But I think, you know, the, the practice that we suggest can be helpful across borders. Um, I mean, I can, I can say we're working with Baclou and they have estates mainly in Scotland, but they have an estate down in England and they are working with us to implement the land rights and responsibility statement um, um, principles and expectations in their English estate as well. So it's very much, I mean, we can't work with English landowners directly, but the, the kind of the work that we do and the guidance and the protocols can be used. Um, it very much is down to the landowner. I mean, I I do sympathise. Um, it is, I mean, it's very, it's fantastic having a land commission in Scotland. It's an amazing thing. Um, it would, and I think James can come in and say, we, there is one, there is a land commission being set up in, is it Manchester, James? Oh, sorry, Liverpool. not Manchester. Liverpool. <laughs> Liverpool, geez, sorry. It'll be Manchester next. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, it's a journey. I mean, in Scotland, this has been grown for a long, long time. And England has huge, deep roots uh, in land act activism and commons. And, and the land, we see that reflected in the land trust movement in England. So things are happening. They're just happening at different pace. And I'd, I'd, it happens despite of political will. I, I mean, it'd be great to see more political will in England and Scot um, Wales, but just, I would say, just, it's happening. People can't stop it. So... Yeah, the political system might catch up in England. We'll see. <laughs> I don't know if James, you want to come in. Yeah, it's just there's always one one kind of funny story that always makes me think that if, if, when we're talking about politics is you know the, the kind of one of the seminal pieces of early land reform um, legislation was the Crofting Act of 1886, 
And the reason that came into being is because Parliament in its wisdom decided to enfranchise everyone who rented an area of, of land worth, was it more than three shillings or something a year, and inadvertently gave the vote to hundreds and thousands of West Coast crofters who then elected crofting party MPs to secure their rights in Parliament. Um, and that's because, you know, landowners obviously south of the border were so distant from, from crofting in Scotland. That was one of the unintended consequences. Um, but these movements always exist. There are, you know, even in Scotland, land reform movement was quite small and is still quite small and, and is often thought of as, as a niche subject. But part of our work has been very much expanding that. And if you look at things like community ownership in Scotland, the vast majority of community owned land is in the West Highlands and in the Western Isles. And that's because that's where that culture has been strongest and where it's developed. And what we're doing now is trying to, to spread that message across the entirety of the country. But these things take time. They'll take, it'll take years. It'll take, it'll take, potentially take generations. Um, and it's, it, you know, it, it's not been, diff it's not been easy for us to do. And I think as, as Ninian said, even just in, in one lifetime with one estate, you can be pushing boulders uphill for a long, long time before you get anywhere, but you have to have the, the kind of the personal and the community will to keep doing it. And eventually, you know, people will follow um but it's it, it's not been an easy path for for scotland to, to blaze and that you know the situation we found ourselves in in the 19th century was not one that we would wish on anyone but that's also been the impetus for where we've got to today so yeah it's, it's maybe not as positive as it could have been but going back to what kirsty was saying we do do a lot of um good stuff and there's nothing to to say that landowners south of the border couldn't take up our our good practice advice as much as they as they do in scotland so that's maybe a, a more positive note to, to answer on. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if Ninian or Adele you'd like to speak in, speak to whether or not Falkland is a special case or a result of special circumstances. Just one, just one kind of thought that's occurring at the moment and partly looking at who's, um, who's here on the call. And um, I suppose my sense is, is that, gosh, gender is quite a significant one here. So the land and the way it is, is because of that thing called primogeniture, which was that the eldest boy inherited all. Um, and there were kind of reasons for that because a lot of women were dying of childbirth and gosh, the men were out fighting. <laughs> the, the way it was for those times, it kind of, it's taken us to where we are. My sense is, is now that is changing. I think even the royal family have decided to change it. So, you know, there is, so, so I think there's something quite significant um, for me. And this does feel, gosh, it is intergenerational. I think it is also, I'm really conscious. My, my grandfather um, was killed in 1915, fighting for a bit of land in Fife. Sorry, in France, not in Fife. Could have, could have been Fife, but in France. And my father lost um, quite a lot of his leg in a beach in Salerno. So there's something about, gosh, this adversarial stuff of fighting for the land. And that there's a kind of a, se a sense to me, certainly in terms of a lot of the people who move up, most of the managers who show up at fault and tend to be women. And we're not, we're not consciously doing that. But I, th I, I think that's quite a significant change and i suspect you see a lot more women farmers these days um so i, I kind of wonder where that will take us and the significance of that oh thanks um thank you ninian uh, so i want to just ask rachel without a surname if she would like to ask her question herself um or i can ask it for her Are you, you're still muted, Rachel. We can see you now, but you're still muted. How about that? Is that better? That's good. Thank you. Sorry, I'm outside. Um, connection is a bit fragile. Uh, yeah, so my question really is, the, I am looking hard for stories like Ninian's and, um, and the Falklands model. And it seems to me that having media like in a you know, a book form or a documentary film that tells the story in a sort of powerful and influential way would be really helpful uh, to people south of the border. <laughs> um, 
to, to sort of tell the story of this sort of enlightened uh, approach to being a, 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 a ancestral landowner. And I just wondered if that had ever been proposed or thought of to, to, to Ninian. I mean, I can see that it's, there's a context as well. I mean, all of this merits a really interesting, you know, film about what you're trying to achieve in Scotland or some kind of storytelling medium like film or book. Mm. So I'm, 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 I'm laughing, Rachel, and you've kind of, you've, um, you've named something which has been around for a while, um, and and I don't quite know the answer to it, but I'll 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 share a little bit of what's been happening. So we have we've had kind of conversations with a couple of publishers, one green publisher who very very much would like to do something on us, and I probably had sort of four or five zooms so far. And what happens is that kind of different sort of books tend to or ideas for different books or so, so there could be a book about huts. They were saying, oh, look, we'll start on huts and building. And then, oh gosh, there's something else that's coming out there. And actually, to be honest, kind of, I certainly don't have any time to write a book. And there's a question of who, gosh, so there's a something about, could we co-author something here? But I think there is a lot of interest. Um, and at the moment, yeah, there's a kind of, the, the last idea was actually there are three books here. Um, and, they're, and, and they're they're small books, but they're about different things and different people write them. Um, I suppose for me, I also want to make the link of authoring and authority. And part of my own story, second son of a second son, I'm thinking, why was me? Is I've been a real reluctant leader. Um, it's taken me a long time to step into myself in the way I am on this call. Um, my son, probably less my daughter, would say the same of him. You know, he's a kind of a back, um, a back, back room person, really. Um, and that finding one's voice is quite a challenge. But I also have a bit of resistance of finding my voice because I think the the voice of the male lairds or landowners is often, or the kings, has been the one that's been told. And there's a bit of how do how 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 does one share that story and how how does that story evolve? So I think there is a book, and I think you know a few folks have spotted that, but. Um, at the moment, we're so bloody busy doing things. I don't know, Adele, do you have a take on that in terms of the Falkland story? Mm. I'm, I'm really liking the, uh, the film, actually, documentary, um, partly because I'm just, you know, I'm just thinking, well, we're already thinking about that and we're all, you know, in Falkland, you're always making little films uh, that tell little bits of the, the story and little bits and and you know that for me the big thing here is is about how do we reconnect that whole system instead of that atomize um, because it just becomes far more powerful, and it also uh, is a is a kind of a, a way a guide for perhaps other landowners or people who want to engage with landowners to to see glimmers of hope or, or ways forward or, or engaging. Um, yeah, you know, and I think I wouldn't really under, part of the thing that for me is often underestimated or, or misunderstood is that this idea of like, you know, we don't actually have many real, real communities of place anymore. And it takes a lot of time to build community that has a shared sense of a connection to, to land. Um, yeah, so, you know, that that's that's a big, that's a big work that um, is often not really um, not really given a lot of of support or or kind of credence in in the planning. And I think that's that's kind of where we're at at, at Falkland is re rebuilding that community and with with the ecosystem, really. You know, um, but yeah, I'm 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 liking the film. <laughs> And I'm really glad you kind of ended on that note because I was going to just close this question with, uh, well, when you are able to and allowed, come up to Falkland and you will see that the story is alive in the place. Um, there might not be the, a book or a film about it just yet, but it's um, the, the, the palace and the estate and the village are one, really. They're very much intertwined. Um, and just by nosing around for a couple of days, I'm sure you'll get a very good sense of how the story is emerging. Um, and the story kind of, like I say, tells itself by being there. Um, 
so moving on now, we, we had a whole breakout room section, which I'm just going to have to write off, unfortunately. Um, so the, and we only do have eight minutes left. So we're really meandering towards closing comments for the session. Uh, and I'm, I'm really sorry to the majority of people who are on this call who haven't had an opportunity to voice themselves, because I was hoping for a much more discursive part of this uh, webinar. Um, so one question that I would really like to seed in everyone's mind before we completely close this call is simply what do farmers and the wider agriculture sector want from land reform? And this session was targeted at, at landowners, land managers, and land users. And um, those are very, the first two are quite easily defined. A landowner is legally owns land, which is pretty simple in our culture. A land manager probably is employed or runs a business to do with land. A land user is all of us, essentially, and is the manager and owner and anyone else who ever, has ever walked across a field, trespassing or not, as it may be, because those rules are radically different in England as well. Um, and uh, just thinking about yourself as a land user being integrated within the agricultural sector, whether or not you are currently farming, you are currently owning or managing land in any way, what is it that you are seeking from a land from land reform, from the process of land reform? So not a land reform act um, as such, but uh, as we've tried to tease out in this session, it is very much a living ongoing process. And what does that reforming process um, inspire within you? And that hopefully links back to the first breakout room that we did manage to do, where hopefully you tapped into a little bit of that inspiration of, of what it is for you um, that, that land reform means. Um, before we finish, finish, um, I would, uh, oh, there's more questions that have come in since I spoke. Um, okay, so there's just been some questions about some similar stories in other places in the country, um, which would be interesting to tap into. Um, but I wanted to ask um, a question towards Ninian um, on behalf of everyone here about what um, the what your reforming process has, what the implications of your reforming process has been for local agriculture as, as a microcosm of how it might apply to agriculture across the board. Because that's why we're all here at the end of the day is because we're really interested in agriculture as one subsection of land use. So um, Ninian, could you speak to that? Because I know there's something very much in process with you right now. So yeah, just very quickly, and, and also noticing that there's a question from Claire around kind of farm starts. Um, so the I did post um, just above yours, Claire, but something about a Radio 4 documentary, and that partly started on something that I can't, was it tw um, 2014 anyway, a number of years ago, we offered a number of um, leases for people up to um, half a hectare for people to kind of get in, and it's it's more at the horticultural end. So we have five people at the moment working on that and they've had one lot and we've now extended that to a kind of second five years. We'll probably bring it to an end at the end of the second five years, but look at then how they might become more integrated in what happens next. Um, so I think in a sense, we've done something that's lots of people growing on Falkland Estate at a fairly small end. Sometimes that's a bit challenging in terms of, gosh, are we tripping over each other? But I think, nobody has gone out of business and actually that we've managed to hold that tension or they've managed to work with that tension. Um, I think in terms of impacting on the current sort of 20th century industrial farm system, actually that's been much slower. So I'm, um, I'm the main owning director of the home farm and that's been really hard to change. And I think we are like, we've got a really good organic um, beef herd and we've, also now got a kind of orchard planned but it's been actually in some ways that's been that's been as hard a work as anything of trying to change when you're already doing some things a certain way so i suppose my sense is there's a bit of working with both and that there's a bit of trying to how do we because my guess is is in terms of when there's quite a lot of land you need to have kit you need to have some kit because actually we're not wanting to go back to feudal times or i don't think very many people are um, but there's a bit of trying to kind of bridge bridge that gap 
Um, and of course, well, we'll see what happens post cap in terms of farm subsidies that might might help or may not help. I don't know if that's answers, but that's my best attempt. Yeah, it was really good to hear because, you know, we are we're all here at the end of the day looking for a, a more enlightened agriculture to be taking place and to hear that's been just as hard work as anything on the estate, you know, that's a really important message to get across that it's it's not all easy. easy waltzing. No, it isn't like we don't make money on farming on the home farm. We haven't made money on home farm for a long time. Um, we're not losing much now but it's actually really, really hard to make money. Partly because we also kind of keep on wanting to have a little bit more of, I don't know, you know, younger people coming in and all of that. But yeah, we're certainly not, in terms of commercially successful, um, we need to be doing more to be able to get more. Um, yeah. It's hard to get food to people who want it. <laughs> Brilliant, well, thank you so um, much. Thanks, Ninian. Um, we, we've got two minutes to three o'clock and uh, with the momentum of the session, I think I'm going to start to wrap up. So I'll start by saying thank you so much for everyone who's attended. And I'm sorry that I haven't heard anyone anywhere near even half the people's voices in this session. Um, gosh, I wish I had a lot more time to open up to questions. And um, if we we're in person as well, I could at least see your faces. <laughs> but as it is, um, we'll, we'll have to be wrapping it up there. And um, I've really enjoyed uh, hearing about the story of land reform from the Scottish Land Commission's perspective and how it applies in practice in Falkland. And I hope everyone here has, has managed to garner something from there, from that. Um, if you want to learn anything more about the process of land reform in Falkland, it, it is segments of it have been documented in, in news outlets and whatnot. So uh, a quick Google will be able to glean some more information. And if you're here and still not quite sure how this applies to you or your context, uh, wherever you are, whether you're in Scotland, England or Wales, um, then I'm sure you can, I'm right in saying you can contact James um, or Kirsty at any point, um, as well as Ninian or Adele, about how, how land reform came into process in the work that they're doing and, and ask them, uh, what can I do as myself, whether you're um, uh, a land user with no particular ties, uh, a farmer of a small, piece of land, a large estate, or an owner with questions um, being raised about what you should be doing with the, with the ownership and future governance of your land. Um, so yes, I'm sure there are still many more questions to be asked. And these, now you know a few names, of a few people who can help answer those questions for you. Um, and with that, with that, uh, I'll just invite um, the speakers to say goodbye in whichever way they like. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Say bye. No, do get in touch. If you have any questions, we're really happy to help. Um, and good luck in all your journeys, your land reform journeys, and keep with it. Yeah, totally. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And, uh... Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And thanks, Finn, for bringing us together. And sorry we yeah. didn't have longer time for other folks. Uh, good. Yeah, well, we're, we've rehearsed it now, so hopefully <laughs> we'll get, make it tighter next time. Yeah, so thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you, Northern Real Farming Conference, for holding this space. So. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, Bye. Thanks. how meeting it ends. Martin, how does it end? <laughs> right click end? I will, just a second, I will stop the recording. I don't know if Nina's still there as well. I don't want to end it in case it ruins something. <laughs> I think Nina was jumping out, wasn't she? I think. So that's yeah. me. Hi, I'm getting ready to leave. It was very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Next time I come up to five.